Our research presenter today is Professor Dean Lee from the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory and the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams. Dean is a graduate both of Harvard College and of Harvard University, where he received his PhD in physics. I've known Dean for many years. I knew him when he was still an undergraduate. Even then, he was regarded as someone with uh, exceptional potential. When he was a senior at Harvard, he won an award called the APCA Prize, a national prize for the best <laughs> undergraduate research done by any senior that year, and that was awarded by the American Physical Society. In 2014, he was named a fellow of the American Physical Society with the accompanying citation for the development of lattice effective field theory as a novel approach to the nuclear few and many body problem and for applications of this technique to the structure of the Hoyle state. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what that means. Um, but before I do that, let me say, Dean was recruited to MSU as part of the Global Impact Initiative in 2017. And he is now a professor both in the Department of Physics and Astronomy and also at FRIB. Um, his work deals with something called quarks and gluons. So if you look inside the nucleus of an atom, you may remember from high school there are neutrons and protons in that nucleus. But inside those neutrons and protons, we now know are even more fundamental particles called quarks and gluons. And one could write down on a single sheet of paper the equations that describe how quarks and gluons interact with each other and scatter off of each other. And somehow they bind together to make neutrons and also individual protons. Now, even though we can write down those equations on a single sheet of paper, the computing power required to solve those equations is so great that in recent history, something like 10 or 20 percent of all United States supercomputing resources were at work trying to solve those equations. And Dean is one of the leaders in developing new methods for solving those equations. Some of the applications of this work include the structure and reactions of atomic nuclei, so very relevant to EFRIB, thermodynamics of nuclear matter, something I'm sure all of you have wondered about, uh, superfluidity in neutron star crusts, and Dean also works on new algorithms for quantum computing. So I've, I've, I pled with Lee, Dean to make his talk as understandable as possible for those of us who are not uh, theoretical physicists. And so he's promised me that he'll do that. So welcome, Dean. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve, for the beautiful introduction. Thank you, President Engler. Thank you to the board for the honor to be able to present my, my research today. So let me start off by um, trying to make a connection to your life. Um, why what we are interested in at EFRIB has an impact on you. So take a look at your hand okay, and ask the question, what am I made of? How did it get there? How was it built? Okay. So if you look at your hand and you ask about the atomic elements in your hand and you rank the atomic elements according to how much mass or weight is there, you find that at the top of the list is oxygen. After that is carbon. After that is nitrogen. Oh, actually, after that is hydrogen. Then, then is nitrogen. And then you can wonder, how did these elements get there? And Steve did a very nice job of introducing the, the idea of nuclei. So let me set some length scales for you so you can have a mental image. This is about a meter. If I divide this meter into 10 billion parts, then I get to the atomic length scale where atoms live and where the quantum world is, the, fun, the funny laws of physics of the quantum realm start to appear. Now, if you go even further, so, so the electrons orbit around the nucleus in an atom, but most of the mass is actually 100 thousandth the size of the, of the nucleus. It's in the, it's, uh, the 100 thousandth the size of the atom. It's in the atomic nucleus. And there's where you see the protons and the neutrons. The protons have a positive charge. The, the neutrons have a neutral charge, no charge at all. And so the differences between these elements are about the different compositions of the nuclei. Okay, and so when we count the number of protons, that tells us we have a certain element. For example, oxygen has eight protons. 
but it can have a different number of neutrons. And, and this is where the, the word isotopes comes from. So if you, if you hear the word facility for rare isotope beams, we're talking about different atomic elements with different numbers of neutrons, okay? Now, I, I talked about these elements, carbon, um, oxygen, I talked about hydrogen. Hydrogen is kind of special in that it was made at the very beginning, in the Big Bang, when the universe was, was there was a Big Bang in the beginning, and hydrogen special and simple because it's just a proton and, and, and an electron. Now, the other light elements I mentioned, like oxygen, carbon, and so on, these were created in stars, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But now, take a look at your hand again, and you, maybe you have a ring on, and your ring would probably be made of something like gold or platinum. And these heavier elements were not made in stars, as far as we know. They were made in a more exotic place in the universe. In fact, there was an observation, um, August in 2017, of the merger of two very bizarre stars called neutron stars. They're small in stature, but they're big in mass, made up of neutrons predominantly. And what they found was that these, these stars merged, they spun around and they actually slammed into each other and they made shock waves in the gravity, uh, in gravity actually, the, the fabric of space and time. And that, that was detected uh, in the United States. And immediately thereafter, they trained telescopes to look at that part of the universe, and they actually were able to determine there was light coming to us consistent with the formation of these heavy elements. So F rib, the facility for rare isotope beams, is all about discovering how these processes occur, what's going on. And my research is on the fundamental end of this, the theoretical side, to try to connect, as Steve mentioned, we have an idea, we understand the fundamental laws of physics, um, at, at least at the level of what Steve mentioned, quarks and gluons. What I work on is making the connection between the fundamental laws of physics to these forefront experiments that we are doing at AFRIB. And the reason why this is important is um, theory We'll try to predict what we see in the experiments. You can make models and make a good agreement between theory and experiment. But the really exciting thing is actually when the theory is strong, it agrees with the experiment, but it doesn't quite match the experiments. There could be new science hiding in that difference. And by doing this fundamental physics, trying to understand how, how well we really understand things, we can actually find new discoveries there. For example, um, superconductivity was asking the question, what happens to electricity, the flow of electrons in a wire when things get very cold? If you didn't care about subtle questions like that, we wouldn't have superconductivity and superconductors. That's actually some technology being used at EFRIP today. So the technique that I use to do my research sounds a bit like science fiction, um, I, I must admit, where we think of, of the universe as being divided into a three-dimensional grid, like, like a chart. And we put the protons and the neutrons on the points of this grid, and we do supercomputing simulations to figure out how they interact with each other. It's like taking um, small pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and figuring out how they need to be put together and then constructing the puzzle and seeing the large-scale structure that emerges. And so one of the questions that we were trying to understand was, why is nature the way it is? And why, if we take the rules and tweak them a bit, is it not behaving in a different way? Understanding the difference between what nature does and what it chooses not to do, you get a full spread of understanding of what is possible. And one of the things we did was we took the proton and the neutron, and we changed one of the parameters of nature. We changed a little bit about how they interacted. And we found that for two particles, it didn't make a difference. They didn't care. When we had three particles, they also didn't care. When we had four particles, they also were very happy. It was just like nature intended. But then when we looked at systems with 16, 20 particles, everything fell apart. The glue that held the protons and neutrons together was not working. In fact, these nuclei that we need for water, for, for carbon in, in our bodies, they don't hold together. In fact, they fly apart and form um, a gas of helium nuclei, which is not really so useful for our bodies, actually. There's, Helium is useful for other things, but not for a body. And so this is uh, represented in this paper that we wrote about. There's this transition that you can make 
um, some very subtle transition by changing some parts of nature and inducing things to fall apart. And that tells us that that nature is actually very subtle. It humbles us, that there's new things going on that we may not have seen. Another thing that we were interested in was um, the structure of these atomic nuclei. So I told you about um, FIB looking at the formation of these heavy elements. So a lot of these elements have lots of extra neutrons. And so in this slide here, I show you the density profile as a, as a function of distance from the center of a nucleus, where the protons are. The protons are in the, the solid symbols, and the neutrons are in the open symbols. And you can see I have here 12 C means carbon 12, where you have six protons and six neutrons. Carbon 14, that's represented as 14 C, that's six protons and, and eight neutrons. And then 16 C is carbon 16 with um, six protons and, and 10 neutrons. And so what you can see is that there is a development of an excess, an excess or a neutron skin around the nucleus. And this is the type of physics that FRIB is exactly designed to try to probe. Right. Another thing we were interested in, going back to this idea of, of fiddling around with nature and something bizarre happened where things fall, fell apart, you may ask the question, how is that relevant for real life? Because in the real universe, things are the way they are. Well, we can actually see the falling apart of nuclei by heating them up. One way you can heat something up is putting it in an oven. That's actually how we do the simulation. We think about putting the nucleus in a box, turning on the temperature. I I'm talking about really high temperatures. Mega electron volts is many, many, many times higher, heavier, uh, uh, hotter than, than the oven in your kitchen. But what happens is that this nucleus, which is like a little droplet, it boils and these helium nuclei fall out and form a gas, like I mentioned before. And that's what's represented here. I've plotted the density versus uh, the radius or the distance from the center of the nucleus as I turn on a temperature hotter and hotter. Now, um, this is relevant to FRIB in that when they collide the nuclei together in the, in, the, in the experiments, they're actually making this oven. And so we are predicting the types of things that will be seen in these experiments. Another thing that we are very interested in is the actual formation of these light elements like the formation of oxygen. Um, this is actually a very complicated process. So we've written a paper on how these helium nuclei interact with each other. And that's actually a tool that we use to understand how carbon plus a helium nucleus binds together in a star and forms oxygen. This is sometimes called the holy grail of, of nuclear astrophysics because it takes a, it's actually rather delicate for this process to happen. But it's key for the formation of all the elements that we care about beyond, beyond oxygen. So we have actually a grant from the NNSA to, to, to calculate this from first principles, from, from the, the basic building blocks. Another thing that we've, we've done recently, this, this is a bit more exotic, a bit wilder, that I find kind of fun. So I, I invited you to step into the quantum world. So the quantum world is really a place where things are very strange. You can have, um, for example, I can be holding up my left hand or I can be holding up my right hand. But in the quantum world, I can be sort of doing both at the same time. And there's a superposition of one and the other. I'm in between. Unless you actually measure whether I've held up my left hand or the right hand, it, it will be actually both. All right. So and this is represented in terms of what's called a wave function. So the wave function sort of tells you whether Let's say we have a, a, a particle. Uh, a particle is, is something that's localized. For example, you can imagine the particle being on the tip of my, my pinky. So the wave function then would be localized to the tip of my pinky. But it could also now be a wave, and a wave that would fill the whole room. So now the wave function would be spread out. So these wave functions are things that we are trying to understand in the atomic nucleus. What does the atomic nucleus wave function look like? And so in this paper that has this really complicated name to it, which I won't even read, um, we found something really kind of counterintuitive, that if we take the parameters of nature and just change them gradually, just some one parameter, change them gradually, that this quantum wave function that can be rather complicated, it lives in this very, very high dimensional space what I mean is it can be anything, okay? This quantum wave function could be an elephant. It could be a glass of water. It could be a table. It can be anything. But the interesting thing was that as we tweaked 
or tune this parameter, it cannot sort of disruptively change from one to the other like some magic trick. It has to behave smoothly. And because it behaves smoothly, you can actually predict what it's going to do just by measuring what it does in a certain region of the parameter space. And we use this to do, to do calculations that were impossible before. So Steve mentioned about supercomputing simulations. So we've developed this technique to do calculations where the supercomputer can do the calculations and then use the smoothness of the, the wave function to actually make a prediction in a region where we cannot calculate. And so now I want to uh, wrap up well, it's with um, telling you that this is a golden age for nuclear physics, for AFRIB, and Michigan State University really is on the frontier of the world on this with the quarter, uh, three quarters of a billion dollar facility, AFRIB. Um, and so AFRIB is scheduled, well, well the target date for, for operations is June 2022, as you know, but it's actually ahead of schedule and we're hoping that it will be um, up and running by 2021. But not only AFRIB, there's, this is actually the, 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 the era of exascale computing, 10 to the 18th floating point or operations uh, per second. And so we do calculations on the Oak Ridge supercomputers, um, some supercomputers in Germany. And we've also are, are, are entering this age of quantum computing where we take the quantum weirdness of the world and use it to our advantage, where we can actually calculate faster, more things in parallel by using this quantum superposition principle. In fact, the, the last topic I mentioned about using the smoothness of the wave function, we're actually applying this to a to, to quantum computing algorithms. So you see in the picture here a quantum computer built by IBM. Um, there are other companies involved in this. So I just want to wrap up by saying that there are lots of interesting, deep philosophical questions that can be actually answered by science, and Michigan State University is playing a key role in all these things. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dean. Uh, you might not know it from this presentation, but I think Dean is actually a local person from the Upper Peninsula. Is that right? So despite your Harvard pedigree, you're actually a Michigander at heart. Um, Houghton, 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 Michigan. Michigan. Dean. Houghton. So, Houghton. I'm, I'm sure there are some questions for Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Dean. Yeah. Dr. Lee, I'm, I'm curious, uh, the, uh, this wasn't something you've covered, but the the facility itself is going to create these isotopes, and, and then there's a medical use. Yes. It, it, can you just explain what, what that actually means? Because, uh, you know, there is a... Uh, a sure. It's hard to even ask the question, but the, the idea is that these isotopes that are... These rare isotopes have this little half-life, but yeah. they have medical value yeah, that's yeah. pretty significant. Sure, sure. Yes, so, so there are certain isotopes that are what are called alpha emitters, that alpha, alpha refers to the alpha particle, which is the helium nucleus I, I mentioned. And these are particularly useful for medical applications in that they don't really penetrate um, tissue very far, so they're very localized in the damage they do. So if you can localize these, these alpha emitter isotopes into, for example, cancer regions, you can kill cancer cells. And so EFRIB is involved uh, talking with, the, with the, the School of Medicine to try to figure out ways that we can leverage um, the, our, our leadership in nuclear physics to actually maybe do some, um, some, some really good things with nuclear medicine and the community. That's pretty exciting. I mean, I, I was told that that, that could be our ability to produce these is going to be pretty significant. Absolutely. And because of that supply and the maybe the inability to transport them to Los Angeles or to New York, yeah. that, that there will be a potential value for what we do here or close by. At least. Exactly. Because, there's, because of the half-life being typically rather short, you can't transport a lot of these things so far. So if we had medical facilities here that could do th do these exciting cutting edge medical procedures, then um, Michigan State University would be primed to, to, to be at the hub of that. That's one of the things that we've talked about in the university community, the importance of the changes we've made in the restructuring of MSU healthcare and the clinical practice, but mm -hmm. also then the relationships that we have with Spectrum, the relationship we have with McLaren, the relationship with Sparrow, the Absolutely. relationship that we've got with the research center in Grand Rapids. So. Yeah. Absolutely. It's an exciting period that's in front of us here. Yeah, yeah. 
if we if we play things right, we can really do great things for the world and for the for the health of, of the people. Uh, any of the trustee, any, any questions or observations? <laughs> <laughs> Were you attending Michigan Tech while in middle school? Uh, I, I, uh, I, I took classes at Michigan yeah, Tech. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> so, uh, build me a few algorithms to train. Can you build me a few algorithms to train so, uh, market trends? Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. It was very, <coughs> very impressive. And uh, I think just it reminds us all of what happens here that uh, is, is really important. And, why this university is uh, a university that matters in the world. So uh, with that, um, and thank you, Dr. Chu. Thank you. Thank you very much.